your throne from desert to the sea all nature testifies your splendor praise the lord praise the lord Dust, with love your spirit breathe you formed us in your very past. to know your wondrous works to tell your mighty deeds and join the everlasting for us praise the Lord praise the Lord sing his praise Resound that drums and choirs ring out. I'll never hear the sound of worship. And every nation bring its honors to the king. A roar of harmonies, eternal praise the Lord. Welcome. Some of us are just back from some days in Nashville attending a conference called Sing. Uh, and uh, the writers of that song were there, and we got to do it three or four times that week. And, and it was wonderful to come back and be able to sing that with you this morning as we begin our time of worship. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We're glad you're here today. You know, last Sunday was a special day, and it was wonderful to see so many here for worship and fellowship. And in truth, every Sunday is a special day for worship and fellowship. And so we are certainly glad you are part of it here today or here with us virtually by video. We welcome all of you. On the screen, you're going to see a QR code, and it is our request that everyone in this room, yes, that means you, and everyone watching us by video at home, that you would take that electronic device of yours and scan that QR code, and that will open an electronic welcome card by which you can register your presence with us today. I'm sorry, you can have a seat. I didn't mean to leave you standing. Um, you can access that same registration card on, our, on the homepage of our website, manorwoods.com. There's a link there that says welcome card. Uh, it's very short, and if you would fill that out, then we'd have a uh, record of who's present with us today, and that matters a great deal to us. So thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. Tonight, after many, many months on hiatus, I am pleased to announce that our Sunday evening programming resumes. Classes for preschool and elementary kids converge for high school and middle school students and our adult choir uh, we'll all meet, not all together, but in their separate places at 6 p.m. And for each of those events, returning and new participants are always welcome to join in. 
As we continue our time of worship, let's watch this video together, which suggests a definition for that very act, worship. After that, we'll be responding in our singing again together before Carl comes to deliver today's message. Let's watch. Worship. Everybody worships. Everyone, everywhere worships something. Whatever captivates the heart's affections, the mind's attention, and the soul's ambition essentially has our worship. We worship everything from pop icons to our jobs to our favorite sports team. While the object and method of worship vary, the act of worship does not. Oftentimes, our worship is focused on ourselves. The pursuit of fame, wealth, and personal satisfaction becomes the focus of our wants and desires, but no matter how much we worship these things, they can never satisfy the deepest longings of our soul. God has uniquely designed us with meaning and purpose. He's divinely created us in his own image. When we worship the created and not the creator, we are left unfulfilled and unsatisfied. We deny God the worship that is rightfully his. When we step into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus, our relationship with God should become elevated above every other ambition, every other affection, and every other activity. It should change everything we do. It begins to change the words we say, the decisions we make, the way we view our circumstances and see the people around us. It changes our goals, desires, and pursuits. Instead of searching for meaning and purpose in our life, it becomes the meaning and purpose of our life. Worshiping God is not limited to singing a song on Sunday morning. It's a lifestyle lived out in reverence to God, wherever he has placed you. There is no sacred and secular divide. Worship involves all of our lives, not just one part. Not just one part. That means we worship as we work, as we parent, as we go to school, as we gather around the table, as we suffer, as we compete, as we love, as we seek, as we create. All that we believe, think, say, and do should flow from our beating heart of worship. So what is worship? It's the outpouring of our lives, led by the Spirit and rooted in God's truth, devoting all we are and all we do to Him, our Creator. It's ascribing worthiness to the one who alone is worthy.
So I got to say that, that the, the chick's message about worship, uh, I promise I did not steal her notes, uh, but it's cool that we're saying the same things. But I think that's largely because we're relying on the same truth, which is always a good thing to do. So, so if you hear a lot of what she said in this, it's, you know, again, we're coming from the same stuff. So there we go. Uh, just as a quick heads up or a quick uh, intro while we're trying to get something else sorted here. Quick joke. I'm bringing it in, you know, because, you know, why not? Why do bicycles fall over? You know what? While you're doing that. Ah. Yes, thank you. Why do they fall over? Too tired. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. I hope nobody's got a good arm right now. So, nothing blunt. So just as a, <clears throat> excuse me, a quick uh, moment of honesty and vulnerability f- about me, uh, it, contrary to popular belief, or if it's not, let's not make it popular, um, I'm human. I make mistakes. I have faults. I screw up a lot. Uh, sometimes they're not on display. Sometimes they are. One happened this morning, in fact. So for the entirety of uh, our marriage, f- 15 years now, um, I have brought coffee to Jen every single morning. There has been a grand total within that year's uh, grand total of about 60 days when I haven't done that. And it was either because I was away or she was away or I was sick or she woke up early and did it herself. And I told her, don't do that. Um, you know, but all in all, she gets it every morning. But this morning was a little bit different. I went downstairs, made coffee, and I just zoned out for a minute. And then I looked over at the Keurig and can I say that? We're not getting sponsored by Keurig. <laughs> Let's get sponsored by Keurig. We need some more pods. No. Um, so the thing's going, it's running, and all of a sudden I realize there's no cup. So two things start to go through my head. One, I'm watching an entire pod of good coffee just go into that tray that I don't want to lift up that metal lid because there's always some scary funkiness in there. Um, but I'm watching it just go, and I'm like, this is a waste of a pod. But then I thought, wait a minute, I didn't put a cup under there. This is not good. But I didn't stop to think, hey, you know what, I should turn this thing off. So it keeps filling up, and it finally spilled out onto the counter. Uh, And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. So the, the, the obvious solution was not apparent to me at that moment. It was, I'm wasting coffee, and I didn't use a cup. It's better to have the obvious solution. Hang on to that. I promise it'll come back. So, uh, in light of football season starting back up, I came across something that will help us distinguish between true fans and those who simply claim to be fans. You know, the true fans are the ones who know why they're there, and the posers are the ones who show up, and they complain because things aren't going how they would like them to go. So, here's a list of the common complaints from the not-so-true fans. Uh, The coach never comes to visit me, so I'm not coming back. Or every time I go, they are always asking for money. Or the people sitting in my row, they don't seem very nice. Uh, These seats are very uncomfortable. Uh, The referees made a decision that I don't agree with, and I know better because I watched a YouTube video. Uh, I'm always sitting with a bunch of hypocrites because they're only here to see what other people are wearing, and then they make fun of them. 
I don't like it when games go into overtime because it makes me late in getting home. Or the band plays some songs that I've not heard before and it's, you know, just didn't connect with me. Or the games are scheduled on days where I'd like to sleep in or I have some errands to run. Or my parents took me to too many games when I was a kid, so I now have, you know, no taste for sports. <clears throat> or along with a YouTube video, I read an article on, on the game, and so I'm pretty sure that I know more than the coaches know, and I can do a better job. Um, and I don't like to take my children because I want them to choose for themselves which sport they like best. You know, it'd be a real pity if this list was applied to the church. Let's pray before something gets thrown. Almighty Father, we come to you, and it's only because of you that we come, that we gather in this place as a people united under your name, made new by Christ, and indwelt with the presence of your Holy Spirit, all of which brings about a transformation of who we are, and it changes our focus, it changes our understanding, it changes our minds, our hearts, our lives, everything about us is changed by you. And so that everything that we do is directed to you. We give you our praise. We give you our worship. We give you our lives. Father, help us to sustain that life of worship in all things and in all places. Father, I ask now that you be with us as we study from your word, that you would teach us from your truth how to be your people who are constantly praising you and worshiping you in all things so that our very lives become a testimony to the world around us of what you can do and what you have done and what you will continue to do in this world by the power of your salvation in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in John chapter 4, <clears throat> we find a very familiar episode of Jesus purposefully taking a break in Samaria, which for a Jew is not very kosher. And he even purposely has a conversation with a Samaritan woman which is Mishigas, which that's your Yiddish lesson for the day. And as we know, if you're familiar with this episode, there's something of a back and forth between them, and it's seemingly odd or cryptic and even challenging. And there's even a bit of dancing around some issues or topics, or at least one person is trying to dance around the things, and this person needs to stop because they're starting to look like Elaine from Seinfeld. If you have no idea what that means, YouTube it and laugh your butt off. In fact, there's a point where the challenge becomes rather uncomfortable for the Samaritan woman because Jesus is exposing things about her relationship issues. And so she tries to dodge the issue by not only changing topics, but also by pushing things back onto Jesus. As John records it in chapter 4, verses 19 to 20, the woman said to him, sir, I see that you're a prophet. And she says this because he knows things about her that she didn't reveal. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you people, you Jews, say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Now, to the average reader, or maybe somebody reading this for the very first time, one might see this and think, how does she segue from relationship choices and trying to hide the truth about those things to a topic about the proper place for worshiping God? It's almost like she's been listening to too much Pandora, where it just makes sense to go from Abba to MC Hammer. But a closer inspection of the text and seeing what's going on with this exchange between her and Jesus, we find a bit of intentionality in her criticism. And it's something that might sound a bit familiar in our own time, but I'm only guessing at this point. Wipe the sarcasm off the page. When Jesus pushes back on her relationship choices, which is ultimately a morality issue, she pushes back on him as a Jew for religious practices, especially as it relates to people gathering to worship God. So in one sense, she could be saying, look, if Jews and Samaritans have gotten on just fine by having two different temple locations, even though we might disagree over who's right, uh, then maybe we should just be okay with the fact that we have different views on relationships, even though we might disagree on who's right. Or maybe it's a way of her saying, you want to come at me about my relationships, how about you first own up to or go focus on your own problems that you Jews have created when it comes to religious life? Moreover, her pushback is one that raises some doubts or even some deep skepticism about who Jesus is, what he's saying to her, and any authority that he thinks he might have to say what he does. And then comes the response. And verses 21 to 24 says this, 
And Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when all of you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Meaning, locations won't matter because the temple is going to be redefined. And then comes something of a wake-up call. You people worship what you do not know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. Meaning, God's promises will be fulfilled through Israel, not Samaritans. But the Samaritans will be the recipients of those blessings when they do come to fulfillment, which is what we saw in Acts chapter 8. Then Jesus says, but a time is coming and and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and the people who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Notice what Jesus does with this response. He takes the focus off of seeking a physical place for worship, meaning the right location, and being aligned with certain human sources of authority, those who claim to be able to define that rightness. And he places it on the necessity of knowing the spiritual nature of worship, the right reasons or the right purpose, and being in obedience with the spiritual source of all authority, the one who does define rightness. And this shifting of focus is related to what we saw last week, with that need for the complete transformation of the heart, one that no longer sees things from a self-interested perspective, but is lived out in accordance with God's perspective for life, which He pours into that new heart of the believer. And given that this transformation of the heart is part of Old Testament prophecy, especially as it relates to God fulfilling His promises in the new covenant age, not just for His chosen people, but also for all nations, which includes Samaritans, And given Jesus' emphasis on the unifying work that enables at least Jews and Samaritans to worship without concern over which physical temple is the right one, because again, it's not going to matter and it won't be needed, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, the Samaritan woman picks up on only one thing that Jesus says, or only one point. But she not only misunderstands it, she also uses it to keep Jesus in the hot seat or to keep him at arm's length. Here's what I mean. In verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one called Christ. Now that's John's clarification for the reader. She didn't say that part. Whenever he comes, he will tell us everything. Now, So she immediately goes to this promised coming Messiah, which means the start of God's kingdom in the world, which, as was commonly understood, brings about world peace, after kicking Roman butt, of course, and uniting all people, Jews and Gentiles, under his law, and worshiping in his holy temple. And the Messiah, especially in the Samaritan view of things, is a key player in all of that. He is the divinely appointed teacher who provides that needed and fulfilling instruction in the ways of God, especially when it comes to worship. But notice how she portrays all of that. She says, I know the Messiah is coming whenever he comes. For her, it hasn't happened yet. The Messiah is not here, and so the kingdom is not here, which means these debates about proper temples will continue, and this Jewish dude right here in front of her is barking up the wrong tree. But that's exactly what she missed in what Jesus said to her just moments before this, especially before she started to push back. He told her in verse 23, a time is coming and now is here. Thus, there's no more waiting. There's no more searching. It's happening right now. And to make sure that this point is clear, which also speaks to another one of her concerns, Jesus said to her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Now, unfortunately, the majority of English translations lessen the force of what Jesus says at this point. To get a better sense of it, it could be read as, the one speaking to you, I am. Now, that phrase, I am, in Greek is ego I me. This would certainly resonate in her ears in ways that we can never imagine. Not only is it found seven times throughout John's gospel to reveal who Jesus truly is, but we also find it in that version of the Old Testament that I know you all read before bedtime, the Greek version, when it refers to the identity of God. In Exodus chapter 3, when Moses asks God for his name and God gives him the name, in Hebrew, it's Yahweh. In Greek, it's Ego I mean. So the one that she is holding out for is right there reaching out for her. Moreover, the one who she thinks is going to come and speak authoritatively about these details of worship, 
He, with divine authority, is right here, right now, revealing the true nature of worship and where it takes place. And that true nature of worship requires not a transformation of physical buildings, but a transformation of the heart. And it's transformation that requires not a fancying up of buildings or stages, but the full submission of the self before a holy and righteous God, without seeking to conceal or distract Him away from that which we would prefer to keep hidden. There must be a complete vulnerability and authenticity before God. The very thing that, as we saw in Isaiah last week, God's people failed to do in their worship of Him because they were more focused on the self, keeping up appearances, doing things when it suited them, and also a refusal to give their whole hearts to the one who is worthy of all of them. But when there is that complete surrender of the self and the new life that God provides to those who faithfully surrender, that is when the heart is able to burst forth with worship. A worship that is fueled by personal knowledge of who God truly is and the life transformation that comes from His gracious work of redemption. And that leads us into something that is sometimes missed in this episode in John 4, which will also lead us to where we need to go next. Now, in fact, I'll go ahead and confess now that this is something that I missed for quite some time. And yes, I'll take Ferris Bueller's criticism on this. Shame on you. But it was brought back into focus for me in a passing comment made by Richard Foster in his generally helpful book called Celebration of Discipline. More times than not, when we read this episode in John's Gospel, we tend to remember the specific declaration of Jesus when he says to the woman, but a time is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. That's the part we know best, mainly because it tends to get most attention. But that's not the end of Jesus' point. We tend to miss the presence, the meaning, and the weight of his very next words out of his mouth, which are necessarily connected to that familiar part. He says, for the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. Now, the term that's used for seek is zeteo, which generally means to seek. Surprise, surprise. But it means to look for something. Now, it does carry an idea of searching for a brief period of time, like you lost your keys, you're going to search, and whatever. But in most cases, it is something done in a determined way over a longer period of time. It's an ongoing pursuit. It's something of a dogged determination to find what one is looking for. And not just for the sake of finding it, but because what's missing is deeply valuable to the one who is doing the searching. Now, we see this in the parable of the woman who lost a coin, and she basically tears her house apart trying to find it and restore it. That's how meaningful it was to her. Moreover, Jesus also uses this term in that same way when he describes how the faithful are to seek after God and his kingdom or how they are to live as his people. But here we see it used in connection with what God does in his relationship with faithful worshipers, or we could say disciples. He searches for them. He longs to find them, and he will tear the place down to get to them because they are deeply meaningful to him. This is an understanding of God that's revealed to us throughout the Old Testament, describing God's pursuit of His people, His desire to uphold that covenant relationship that He has with them. And it's a revelation that we see completely fulfilled in the person of Christ, where God did not remain distant from His people, beckoning them to learn about Him or to do some good deeds here and there, all in the hopes that they might get closer to Him. Instead, we see Him personally coming to this world to be with His people And to give them not just head knowledge about, but especially heart knowledge of who He truly is. To do the greatest good imaginable, even at the greatest cost. All with the purpose of ensuring the restoration and the reuniting of humanity with God. An eternal blessing declared in the temporal world made available to all. And for those who faithfully submit to Christ and who He truly is and His saving Lordship... All that is in this temporal and finite world cannot compare, nor does it deserve to be held near the infinite grandeur of who God is and all that He has in store for us in eternity. And so when Jesus says in verse 23, but a time is coming and is now here, or now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such people to be His worshipers. The reality and the expectations of what that means to be true and faithful worshipers is not only made plain, but it's also reinforcing other core teachings related to that life of faithful discipleship. 
a life lived in service to God and His kingdom. And in this case, our worship of God is a reflection of what He has done in our lives, as well as an expression of our allegiance to Him as Savior and Lord, and our commitment to serving Him and His kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. A reflection, expression, allegiance, and commitment that's not just personally upheld, but especially embodied by the community of believers. And not just on occasions, or you know, just for an hour or so on a given day, but as a way of life. A life where everything that we do is in service to worship, faithfully done in spirit and truth. And that takes us to where we need to go next. Now, for another moment of honesty, this particular message was originally going to explore how serving and worship relate to each other, both in weekly gatherings and in our daily life, you know, things outside of these gatherings. However, it quickly became apparent that it would be better to treat each one of these things separately. So our focus for the rest of our time this morning We'll consider what it means to serve God and His kingdom in our weekly gatherings of worship. Next week, we'll focus on serving with the self, all of who we are. And we'll see what it means to serve God and His kingdom from our weekly gatherings. And one thing that's going to be core to both of these things is the need for that one foundational truth to be a reality, which was explained in John 4. The heart must be one that is faithfully worshipful. So with that in mind... Let's see what we need to see now. Worship comes out of and is committed to a recognition of who God is and all that He has done, both in creation and the lives of His people. Now, let's take a slight detour because it's necessary. I'm not sure if you've ever noticed this, or maybe you have, but there's something of a wake-up call related to that twofold recognition. On a few occasions, Scriptures will show creation, as constantly declaring God's presence, His majesty, and His amazing splendor of His work. For example, and to use one of the more well-known passages from the Psalms, in Psalm 19 it says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky displays His handiwork. Day after day it speaks out. Night after night it reveals His greatness. Notice the emphasis on the constancy of the recognition. Creation does not fail to reveal, to worship, and to give praise to its creator. And from that, we could say creation does not seek to exalt itself, but instead exalts the one who gave it life. However, as we also see throughout Scripture, humanity, God's greatest creation, has to be constantly reminded to recognize God's presence, His majesty, and the amazing splendor of His work. Moreover, humanity has to be constantly reminded that they're not God. They are not the center of all things. Thus, they are not worthy of glory and worship. Now, this reminder is necessary because of humanity's propensity for celebrating self-importance. And self-given lordship inevitably leads to a life of self-worship. And such a life reflects and relives, almost ad infinitum, the fall in the garden, brought about through the persuasive influence of Satan especially his enticing promise that humanity, the Creator's greatest creation, can become just like the Creator, an approach that makes him difficult to detect and his true nature not as readily discerned. Or as a pastor friend of mine recently said, the devil doesn't come dressed in a red cape and pointy horns. He comes as everything that you've wished for. But in falling prey to the enticing influence, humanity does not rise to a new level of greatness or achieve comparative godhood. Instead, it falls into an unthinkable depth of corruption and separation from the only one against whom there is no comparison. And one of the more clear and upfront teachings about all of this is found in Paul's letter to the Romans. And he illustrates this wake-up call, and he does so right near the front of the letter. So there's no waiting around to find out what he's going to say. Here's what he says in verse 20. So on the one hand, Paul points out what creation does. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, His eternal power, His divine nature, have been clearly seen because they are understood through what has been made. Notice that, like the psalmist, the focus is entirely on God, as revealed through His creation. But also notice what it does not say. It's not saying all of creation is God, or that God is in creation. That way of thinking will sell lots of books, but it's utter heresy. But then on the other hand, Paul shows what humanity does after setting things up by saying, so people are without excuse, but that ideal doesn't last very long. 
For although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or give Him thanks. But they became futile in their thoughts, meaning their minds were made foolish or they were brought to nothing. And their senseless or stupid hearts, trust me, that's a better translation, were darkened. And from there, Paul goes on to describe how while believing that they were in the right because they were living in accordance with their self-given wisdom, it's just the ancient version of the modern fad of my truth, they proved themselves to be false and foolish by turning away from the immortal and infinite God and devoting themselves to mortal and finite things that they can create for themselves or even exalting themselves and their self-pleasing desires. And building up what we saw last week, meaning God does not praise or affirm these kinds of things, Paul drives home the point when he says this, Therefore God gave them over in the desires of their hearts to impurity, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshipped and served... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> there we go. I was working on a door yesterday, installing a new door because one was bad, and so I've got sawdust all in my throat. Didn't wear a mask. But it was just me in the garage, me and the bugs. So they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creation rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Thus they made presence, majesty, splendor, exaltation, and worship all about them. Now, raise your hand if you honestly think that God's going to look upon these kinds of things and say, well done, my good and faithful people. Good, no hands went up. Of course he's not going to do this. Because that's not the kind of worshipers that God seeks and blesses. And He doesn't seek these kinds because they're not seeking the worship of Him alone, faithfully, in spirit and truth, no matter what they claim and no matter how passionately they do so. So when we say, in doing this on the basis of Scripture, that worship comes out of and is committed to a recognition of who God is and all that He has done, both in creation and our lives, What we're saying is that when we come to God in worship, both individually and as a community, our purpose and our reason must be entirely about God. Because true faithful worship is always about Him. It is never about us. And we have to stress this in our world today because the opposite has made its way into the life of the church. Largely through the subtle rise and enticing influence of an entitlement-driven consumerist mentality which is mixed with just a touch of cultural narcissism. Okay, a touch might have been what it was years ago. It's more along the lines of this now. And because of that, the church, especially the worship service, it tends to be offered or marketed as an experience to be personally enjoyed because its aim is appeal to or cater to the wants or the expectations of potential consumers. And that leads to the creation of an environment where the perks or the right boxes are ticked off, and then the participants, along with their preferences, become the ways of defining that experience that is offered by the church. Think back to the issue of the woman at the well and her perspective, very similar to this. Because the, and we also remember that that sort of approach is neither what God desires for worship, nor is it what He designed the church to be and do as a worshipful community. Everything that we do must always be about God and never about us. This is a truth that Francis Chan years ago succinctly conveyed to a disgruntled member. The person came up to him after service and said, I didn't really like that service. Its style was not to my liking. To which Francis just very calmly but directly said, well, it's a good thing that we weren't worshiping you today. (laughs) Now, that might seem a bit blunt or harsh, but it's certainly less problematic than the mindset that it confronts. Now, in this case, the bluntness and the harshness was necessary because it was a wake-up call for what it means to be God's people, those who are united in one name, those who gather for one purpose, and those who come to worship only one Lord. And none of those things have anything to do with the self. Thus, our worship cannot be about what we selfishly or self-interestedly expect or what we might get out of an experience. Instead, our worship must be all about who God is and all that He has done. And it must be the time where we surrender to God's work of removing from us that which defiles and separates us from Him 
so that we might be filled with what He desires to put within our hearts and bring us into closer communion with Him. And so what does He desire to put in our hearts? Very simple. His presence, His truth, His power, His purpose, and the new life that only He can provide. Thus, as Pastor uh, Rich Velotis once said, uh, the best witness that we have as the church is not our good music or slick performances, but our transformed lives. And it's from that transformation and that filling of who we are by God that we are able to faithfully and freely worship God in spirit and truth. A state of being made possible because of that new heart that God gives us in Christ and sustains by the Holy Spirit that enables us to take the focus off of ourselves and fix our eyes on God alone so that we can praise Him for all that He truly is, for His abiding presence among us, and for the majesty of His reign over all things and the amazing splendor of His mighty works both in creation and the recreation of our lives. And all of this becoming the foundation and the framework of our worship of Him as God, Creator, Sustainer, Provider, Redeemer, Lord, King, and Protector. A worship that declares our lifelong commitment and allegiance to the one true God. A declaration that defines not only our lives as individual believers, but also as the communal body of Christ, who exists to glorify Him and to serve His kingdom at all times, and in all places. And all of this glorifying of God, receiving from Him, and being equipped by Him with what we need to serve Him and His kingdom faithfully is one of the primary reasons why we gather to worship. As it's been expressed in various ways throughout this message so far, all that we do within our worship is about directing our hearts and our lives to God alone and surrendering ourselves to the transformation that He seeks to make real in our life. And we accomplish this through worship which is made up of different yet necessary parts or expressions of our faithful devotion. Thus, worship, as the chick said in the video, it's not about or it cannot be reduced to just one singing part in the service. It's not just about that. Instead, worship happens in prayer, in song, in music, in meditation, meaning deep reflections on God and His truth, not navel-gazing. Reading His Word, being instructed by His truth, whether that means in a sermon or in a small group. Communion, edification, and fellowship of believers. All of these expressions, especially when taken together, draw us closer to God so that we might know Him better and have our lives brought into conformity with who He is and all that He has done for us in Christ. Thus, when we gather to worship God, we do so by fully and faithfully submitting who we are and how we live to undergo that transformation that God provides and makes real. We come not only to have our individual and communal lives changed, but also to ensure that the body is being properly fed, strengthened, healed, edified, trained, equipped, and encouraged by God in Christ through the Holy Spirit. To borrow a passage from last week, this is partly why the writer to the Hebrews says, let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works, not abandoning or leaving helpless our own meanings, as some are in the habit of doing for self-interested reasons, so nothing new. But encouraging each other, and even more so because you see the day drawing near. Thus we gather because we desire to honor God with one voice, but also because we are designed to be together. We are not meant to be alone, either from God or each other. Or to say this bluntly, it's really difficult to be strong in the Lord if we cut ourselves off from the one who is the source of that strength. And it's really difficult to be stronger together if we neglect and separate ourselves from those to whom we are united in Christ and firmly established together in Him. But the heart, both of the individual and the community, that is fully surrendered to God, faithfully seeking after Him, and humbly serving His kingdom, that is a heart that knows its source of strength and life, and it does not desire to be separated from either. Moreover, that is a heart that knows the strength and the livelihood that comes from the God-designed body of Christ, and it does not seek to redefine, reshape, or even mutilate it, and thus rob it of its power, its function, and its purpose. A faithful heart knows its creator, his majesty, his amazing splendor, and the life it now has in the body of Christ will always have cause to burst forth in worship, and will faithfully do so in spirit and truth. A spirit and truth that can be summarized by what William Temple said years ago. Worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It is the quickening of conscience by His holiness, nourishment of mind by His truth, 
purifying of imagination by His beauty, opening of the heart to His love, and submission of will to His purpose. And all of this gathered up in adoration is the greatest of human expressions of which we are capable. Let us be people who define our worship like that. Where God is the focus and everything is about Him, it's never about us. And may that testimony ring forth in the world around us that they may see the life transformation that only God can provide. So our worship here needs to be reflected out there. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we thank you for this glorious day. We thank you for the new life that you have provided. And we thank you that you are the creator of both. You have created all things. It is only by your power, your wisdom, your might, and who you are that all things exist. And Father, we know that when you created us, you created us, not anything else in creation, but you created us to be your image bearers. You created us to be in communion with you, to be reflections of you. Father, we beg for your forgiveness for the times that we have failed to recognize who you are, what you've done, and who we are called to be. We ask that you forgive us. We ask that you help us. You help our unbelief. You help our failing. You rid, of, you rid us of those things that keep us from knowing who you are and being who you have called us to be. Father, we submit all of who we are to you, not just the little pieces that we're comfortable with, but we submit everything to you. We give it to you for your glory. And we ask for your transforming power in our lives to make us faithful worshipers of you who do so in spirit and truth but do not do so in ways that are private or secluded but do it in ways that are openly and unhinderedly public that our lives become that living testimony of the gospel's truth that you have come into this world to seek and save the lost and give new life to give new hope to give new purpose and to restore the broken relationship that we caused all because you are seeking us. You desired the reunion between us and you. What a great and loving and compassionate God you are. May we never forget that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together church. Man, it feels good to see you guys. Wow. Let's prepare ourselves for communion with the verse. On the first day of the week, we come together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept talking until midnight. <laughs> Acts 20 and 7. This phrase, the first day of the week, occurs exactly seven times in the Bible. All stress the fact that it was this day that the greatest thing in history had taken place, the conquering of sin and death. The verse also tells us this was the day in which the disciples assembled together, heard the word of God, and remembered the Lord's death and his resurrection in the breaking of bread. So, as it is written, we remember. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink, for drink from it, all you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. It's Matthew 26, 26 to 28. This day of the week always should be a time of remembering and rejoicing. And yes, rejoice. We've been washed in his blood, forgiven of sins, and no longer a slave to death. Now that's something to be joyful for. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we just give you praise and we honor you and we, we just love you, Lord. Please give us that worshiping heart because you are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, and the creator of everything that is and will be. Lord, we love you. We love your son and we thank him for the sacrifice. Because one day we will be with you. And Lord, we pray these things in your precious son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.
majesty and throne. Let's stand together. that Acts 20 passage because it's biblical justification for long sermons. Yeah, but then he was brought back to life and then he kept on preaching. So, you know, minor hurdles, man. Come on. I'm also taking Paul's advice. Imitate me as I imitate... Never mind. Okay. 
tell you what, let's do something more meaningful. Uh, Near the end of his letter to the Ephesians, Paul says this, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for this is dissipation or debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Let our lives be a constant mode of worship. And may we do it as one voice, as one people united in one name. Amen? We'll see you.